I'm Sherilyn Skolnicki, and this is Brilliant Balance, the show for working women who are ready to shine. Each week, I bring you ideas, inspiration, and insight on balance, business, and getting it all done gracefully. You ready? Let's be brilliant. This is episode 174 of the Brilliant Balance podcast, and today we are talking about how lying impacts us and what we can do about it. My guest today is Lori Gerber. Now listen, Lori is a dynamo. She is a life coach and a speaker, and she is currently the head of the Handel Group. And they have coached within their practice a number of really well-known celebrity clients. In fact, the way I learned about Lori and her company is that Hugh Jackman has engaged their founder as his coach for the last several years and speaks so glowingly of her that I was like, I have to figure out who is behind this story. They've also coached Mel Robbins and Dr. Mark Hyman, to name just a few. Now, one of the core tenets of this coaching practice is truth-telling. And so it makes them kind of experts in lying and in telling the truth. And Lori really sees her work as being there to help humanity see and feel the freedom that can come with truth-telling and what happens when we clean up what they call our personal pollution or our own collection of lies. So Lori teaches really practical tools, tools about how to dream and how to bust through our excuses and how to action plan for our future. And of course, how to tell the truth. Personally, she lives in New York City with her husband of 22 years and three children who are 18, 16, and five at the time that we are recording. My interview with Lori was fast-paced. It was funny. It was incredibly honest, which I'll warn you, can be a little startling. Um, I think truth-telling at this level is so rare that it can actually make us feel uncomfortable. So pay attention to that feeling if you're having it and see maybe what the source of it is, right? Where is that feeling coming from? Because there's so much good that can come from being honest with ourselves and with others, but we're kind of inherently bad at it, like so bad at it that you might think this is crazy as we get into the interview. Also, I want to give you a heads up that some of the examples Lori uses in this interview are adult examples. They are not appropriate for young ears. So if you are listening with your children in earshot, you may want to pop in those AirPods or a headset before you continue on with the episode. Okay, let's welcome Lori to the show and find out exactly what truth-telling can do for us. All right, well, Lori, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I am very happy to be here. Your energy is so great. I can tell this is going to be a lot of fun. So let's start by getting everyone grounded in what your life looks like these days. Because I think we always love that peek behind the curtain. So tell us what today's schedule looked like. I just want to like share my screen with you and just let you actually, people do get freaked out when they see my calendar. Can you, uh, no, I'm I'm not able to screen share. No. So, um, so my day starts between 540 and six, which I love because that, because I have a five-year-old, I have a five-year-old, a 16-year-old and an 18-year-old. So I love my day starting way before. Tell me if I'm giving too much detail. Okay. No, it's perfect. <laughs> I have to give you a lot of detail. So between 5, 40 and 6, depending on if I'm working out or not, this morning I was both working out and having my spiritual contemplation date with one of my girlfriends. So I needed my 5, 40 wake up call. So wake up, meditate, check my email. I know I shouldn't, <laughs> but I do. It makes me happy. Then exercise. I'm into like my new challenge is I'm going to master this ballet video and be able to do it all the way through by the end of Q1. So I'm got to like, got to stay on that. feels so good when you exercise in the morning before the sun's up. Oh my gosh. And I'm literally just in my office. Like I'm right over there with the video on my floor, like no equipment, no gym, no cost me nothing. I'm exercising. Then I'm showering, getting myself. I, this takes some beautification. (laughs) <laughs> it just takes about an hour to do the hair, the makeup, the, the, you know, the dressing, the whatever. And then I get to be with my kid and my husband briefly. And I do, you know, like I do kid, kid prep, day prep, breakfast yes. prep, et cetera. Then almost always at 9am I'm live on Instagram or on zoom with my wake up community, which is a free thing I've been offering since the pandemic started to just get people grounded. 
But today I got to talk to a potential client instead because today I took the day off of that because we're experimenting with seeing if I can have a day off. (laughs) Um, And then the rest of my day is a beautiful combination of all the things I love. So I get to talk to prospective clients who want to use me for either couples work or individual work. I get to, or, you know, want to look at our digital programs. I get to coach clients. So I still coach like 20 world change agent type humans. I mean, I'm the head coach. I've been around for 16 years, so I don't do like all coaching anymore, but I still coach. I love to keep uh, in that. I'm working with one of my couples today in the afternoon, which is going to be great. So my day is a combination of, you know, sales conversations, actual coaching conversations, and then things like this, where I go live or get interviewed or something like that. So that's the rest of my day. And then in the evening, I actually have another friend date tonight, which is this unusual for me to have two friend dates in a day. These are like half an hour Zooms. Don't really imagine I'm, you know, going out. out No, (laughs) it's a half an hour Zoom. Like we might watch something together, you know? And then we have, we have Friday night family Zooms, which we started when the pandemic started, which I love because I get to actually see my brother, my sister-in-law, their kids, my mother, my father, my aunt, my uncle, my mother-in-law every week now. That's so awesome. Like, why didn't we start this before the pandemic? I don't ever want to go back to in-person. Like in-person, it's chaos. Here I can like mute them. I can mute myself. I can walk away and go to the back. Like it is so nice. I get all of, I think the best parts of family togetherness with none of the crappy. Everybody can eat what they want. (laughs) Nobody has to eat what one person does. Yes. And then we all do show and tell. So like, there's also like an order to it where we get to hear from everybody and connect and we, we say blessings and, you know, it's just a beautiful ritual. And then I get have a date with my husband. Oh, Lori, I am confident <laughs> that there are women listening <laughs> who are envious and women listening who are inspired. And I hope everyone makes the shift from envy to inspiration because there's so much good to extract from what you just shared. But the biggest thing I take away is you're so delighted by all of it. Like you clearly love your life it. and you have a lot of cool things to look forward to. And yeah. that's what it should feel like. So yeah. and let it. me say, I'm not always this delighted. And when I saw that question, I was like, oh, I'm so glad she asked me today. <laughs> like, I have such a balanced day. Because there are days absolutely where it's like, I get, I always do my morning meditation and beautification and rituals and all. I go up on my roof and chant, like I do fun shit and stuff that's in fine. the morning. <laughs> and I, so that's like a given, but there are days that I am just working from like 8 a.m. to 6.30 and then I'm on family duty from 6 30 to 9 and then I go to sleep. Sure. <laughs> and that's what it's not as interesting as today. That's why we talk in this community a lot about the week as kind of the ideal planning mechanism. Like there's no day that every day does not get constructed right. perfectly. But in a week exactly. you can fit in the things that you care the most about for sure. I agree. Okay. So you are essentially an expert on truth telling these days. And we're so fascinated by this topic. I could not wait to have you on the show. This is a really big deal because apparently we're all a bunch of liars. And I'm learning this through your work. So in a UMass study that you quote in your TED Talk, 60% of us tell at least one lie in the first 10 minutes of a conversation. Is that really true? Uh, Just start with like, how are you? Great. Fine. (laughs) It's like the first second of a conversation. You don't have to go any farther than that. We lie about how we are, right? Yeah, we really do. And it is natural. It's like, think about your baby. Your baby fake cries to get attention. Pigeons, you know, if you watch the TEDx dog, right? Like we are programmed to do it. It's a survival mechanism. We think we're going to die. We think we're going to get kicked out of the herd. We think we have to present a particular way. So it's like as natural as breathing. Nobody is escaping it. Even if you're like someone who's like, well, I would never cheat on my spouse or I would never steal money or I would never, you know, like bold face lie. Like, no, I didn't go shopping today. Fine. Great. You have your version. <laughs> like I have my version, which is, I have my version, right? Which I'm happy to talk about if you didn't get enough in my, in my TEDx. But we all have our version. And I think that for when you start paying attention to this, right? After I crossed paths with your work and Lauren's work and started really paying attention to this, it is absolutely stunning how frequently one of the types, you know, you have seven categories of lying we're going to talk about. One of them shows up in conversation and it's, it's fascinating how prevalent it is. And we're going to get into this also how toxic, right? Also how, how much it can really get under our skin when we don't kind of keep the air clear, right? With truth. Exactly. Okay. So you say there are seven categories of lying. I'm going to run through them quickly just so everyone listening kind of has 
the context. And then I've got a couple questions. So there's outright lying. Like, I never got your text. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? <laughs> no one's ever done that, I'm sure. Right. Lying by omission. I'm just going to skip over this and not tell anybody because it's not necessary. Yeah, no one asks. No one needs to know. Lying by exaggeration. This this one sounds like it's pretty prevalent, right? Just that slight oh, inflation. Yes. Oh my God, I'm about to close the deal. My daughter like, calls us on this all the time because I'll say something like, I'm starving. And she's like, you're not starving. Exactly. My, you know, like I'll be there in five minutes, right? right. Like, no, you won't. <laughs> Don't exaggerate. Yes. Lying by under exaggeration. I thought right. this he's, was- he's not drinking that much. He only has like a drink a night. So we <laughs> undersell the reality. Lying by misrepresenting a story. So it, this is how I think it happened. I'm going to tell you how I think it went down, but actually in my head, I know it yeah. went down a different way. Yeah. Like uh-huh. that was a great conversation. I think we really connected when you're like, but actually, great meeting. Fun. I loved your presentation. Exactly. Super ideas in there. Yeah. Lying by avoiding confrontation. That's a big one. No one even thinks that's lying. What does that look like? That's when you're having a whole conversation in your mind with yourself about how you really feel about the person, but out of your mouth, total different story. Oh, that's yeah. happening in dating. That's happening in marriages. That's happening in business relationships. That's happening with your children. Like, that's me. I'm just not going to say anything. About and you're that. like, and I'm a nice person for not. Like I'm being yeah. good. I'm like saving them, even though in my right. mind, I'm you're being them. nice. You're being nice. Oh, that's a good this, one. As a loyal, we call it loyalty. We call it kindness. We call it generosity. We call, we call it many nice things. We are really off the hook. Diplomacy. For yeah, exactly. Okay. Lying by keeping secrets that you're taking to the grave with you. That's intense. Yeah. yeah. That's an intense one. No one can know about my abortion, about my disease, about my history, about my parents' mental health, about, you know, yeah. And and funny enough, I reel those off because they're some of the mo- more common ones that people are taking to the grave. Yeah. Um, it's, and they all sound, as you say them, right? Or, my eyes got big. Like they all sound real intense, but a lot of people have one, right? Have exactly. some kind of a big that's, thing. That's the joke is like everyone's keeping their little compartment closed, pretending like they're the only ones. And yeah. as soon as you start telling, you know, I've told all mine and I help people tell theirs. No one's ever shocked. Like no one's ever shocked about abortions, miscarriages, mental health, suicides, medications, drugs, addictions. Like it's not even a hundred things long. It's like mm-hmm. thirty things that humans hide mm-hmm. that are considered taboo. It's, it's not like we're. It's like we think we're protecting ourselves or them or the person that we're not sharing with. And what we're doing maybe is robbing ourselves of compassion. You know, and connection. that for one thing for sure, for sure. Yeah. Like that's. Well, which of which of those seven do you see the most often? Like, are there some that are? Wow, these are just super prevalent. I mean, every everyone does all of them, truthfully. But and we even only give you the list just to get your mind going because there's probably other ways. Sure, you know? Like, sure. like I have one that I call the Lupolian, <laughs> right? And it's just like it, truly, I have this promise to myself to do 400 push-ups a week. Okay. And for years I did it on my knees. But if I asked my coach, like, hey coach, do you think I'm doing these on my knees? When I say 400 push-ups, she would have been like, no. no. And then up until like two weeks ago, I'm doing them with my feet against the wall. And I'm like, and and literally I have the thought to myself once a month, twice a month, like, I wonder if this is coach. Like, I wonder if this is a push-up if I have my feet against the wall. And who cares? Like, it's not a moral issue, but it's like right. for me. Every time I'm going, am I being honest? Am I telling the truth? So, but I'll find a loophole. I'm like, it's still a push up. Who's to say that's not a push up? The Except loophole. It's- Interesting. So yeah. I find loop. So I think people have all different categories. And it's, what's most interesting to ask is what's yours? You know, like what is your, what's your brand? What's your go to? Mm-hmm. Figure out your favorites. But the thing I think I can see absolutely universally across the board is people lying to themselves about what's important to them lying about what's important to them, which means then you're lying to other people about what's important to you. And that's something everyone can relate to. It's a little easier to swallow that you're lying about that. Mm -hmm. Um, You may not like that I'm calling it lying, but we call it lying. So people start to, again, get, understand the negative impact of it and, and see it that way because people want to tell the truth. People believe in that as a value. So sometimes it's easier to get someone to be inspired by the idea of telling the truth more than even chasing their dreams, right? Chasing their dreams could seem frivolous, but telling the truth seems like the right thing to do. That's fascinating. It, it will, because I'm, I'm 
definitely sure that in coaching conversations with women, and if I think about myself, we think it is an act of kindness to not speak the truth, to hold it back, measure it, twist it, you know, position it. There's, we, we think we're being kind and this is territory I want to get into about how do we do this in a way that does preserve a level of kindness and compassion. You have to. We don't want to walk around being, you know, mean human beings. So, but we are mean human beings in our heads. We really are. It's like a lot of garbage up there. It's so there's a sense in your work of like owning that, just owning that that's a sense of humor. Yeah. Like, (laughs) how am I that mean in my head? Yeah. It, we have a 12 module program and in our fourth module is literally just to track your thoughts for two weeks. We have you just track your thoughts. It is so fascinating. It's like a blood test, right? You go in, you track your thoughts and you're like, oh. so oh studies show 80% of, we have 12 to 60,000 thoughts a day of which 80% are negative. And my joke is like, if you're on the East coast, it's like 90%. We, we, we were in the middle of the country. You're dead. Like, we over index on an average. It's an average 80%. And I don't even think the other 20% is positive. It's like neutral. Like take a left at the corner, you know, oh, there's a target, right? Like, so we are obsessively negative. That's just scientific. Like that's our- Toward new- ourselves and toward other people. Every, it's yeah. all about everything. We're, yeah. just, we're, we're terrible. So, so yeah, there's a retraining. The light. Yeah. So you shine the light, you laugh at that. You don't try to think you're ever going to not be, right? But with the awareness, there's a choice, of course. Fascinating. So- the thing that that I was really struck by is that, because it would be easy to think like, I'm just going to stick with these lies, but it, it has some pretty serious side effects, right? Yeah. Like it can manifest as health issues. And I want to talk about some of those. It can isolate us. I was saying, you know, rob us of that connection and compassion. It can screw up the integrity of our relationships. Like what relationship is it? If you're just lying to each other, there's not truth in it. Excellent point. But since we do it so much, there have to be benefits. Oh like, yeah. What what do what do we oh. think are the benefits? Why do we I'll do I'll tell you. You you're trying to get what you want. It's like a baby crying to get the cookie. <laughs> it's the same reason anybody or lying to get the fake crying to get the cookie. So it's it's we desperately desire control, which means and we're afraid. We're afraid we're going to be rejected, we're afraid we're going to die, we're afraid we can't get what we want. You know, we're afraid of all that. So we lie to manipulate people and get what we want whether it's just like a peaceful conversation that we want or to get to our TV show or to get money or to get sex or to get, you know, so there's lots of good reasons to lie or just to not have to reveal, you know, not to have to feel something. That's Mm -hmm. another big one. Like if you start telling the truth, you're going to, the minute our first assignment is to write down your dreams in all your areas of life. No, no. I had done 20 years of personal growth before I came to Handel Group. No one ever even asked me to do that because when I sat and did it, I was like, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to admit the truth about what I want in all the areas. Like, you want me to talk about love and sex? You want me to talk about money? Because Mm -hmm. if we admit the truth, then what? Then you have to do something about it. Then Ah. you feel your feelings. If I admit I haven't had sex with my husband in three months, if I admit I yell at my kids uncontrollably, if I admit I'm eating sugar at every meal, if I admit I actually don't like my job, Oh my God, I'm, there's going to be so many feelings. Feelings um, and a, a desire or a feeling like I should push. change something because exactly. now there's work and I don't want to Denial do has been unlocked. Exactly. And, and now, now everything is, now the heart is, has a line to talk to your head. We yes. want to keep the heart separate, right? That's why we eat and drink and watch TV and work too much and, and get distracted. We don't want the heart and the head to talk. Yes. <laughs> the head's got to get through the day. I feel like there's a lot in this for mothers. I realize this applies to everyone, but I think there's so much of an acceptable narrative for mothers about what we prioritize and what we want and what we think that there's like, if you're out of sync with that narrative, it would be so uncomfortable to admit that, right? So we sometimes have, you know, women who will say like, I don't really like playing with my children. I don't like the I don't like playing, right? And then everybody goes, oh, and yeah, it's relatable. Other people have had that experience. They would agree with that statement, but it's it's provocative even to yeah. state that. Like, I don't enjoy the activity. It's like, we're supposed it's to It's not enjoy- developmentally appropriate for adults to play the way children <laughs> like to play. I have an ongoing debate with my daughter. Like, how many minutes do I have to play family? <laughs> You know, we are a family. <laughs> you could just help me with the dishes. <laughs> She's like, no, we have to 
play family. Play like, family. <laughs> oh, I love I'm like, that. You can have 10 minutes of play family and I get an hour of you help Real me with yours. <laughs> But it's, I think that's, it's so important that we confront that because then what happens, right? Play that out. We lie and say, oh, I love playing family in your example with my children. And then we make commitments based on that. And then we're miserable in those commitments. Really? And then we're not getting to the things that we really would excite us and fulfill right. us. So it this is where we can happy. confront that word selfish. I think this is where the truth starts to feel selfish. Talk a little bit about yes. that. Yes. Okay. I personally, this is my belief, right? Everybody's entitled to their own beliefs. We really try to help people get to their, their core beliefs. My core belief is that the most important thing you can do for your kids is to demonstrate a happy life because I believe they do what we do, not what we say, just as we unfortunately do some things that our parents do or react in an extreme reversal of it, which often isn't that different. So my highest priority is to make sure that I am living a happy and fulfilled life, which really means to me meaningful activities and work that make a difference on the planet and being in love with the love of my life and being healthy, right? Like those are the three things I want for my kids. So I need to demonstrate and fulfill that for myself because they're going to do what I do, not what I say. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's selfish. That's in alignment with my highest ideals. Obviously, you got to question the you have to, we all have to be critically thinking about the reason why someone might be feeding us a particular value system, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I know that self-sacrifice in mothers is like the oldest trope in the book. Who is that serving is a good question. Who's selling you that? Who's encouraging that? Who, and just ask, right? Like maybe your partner doesn't want that dynamic to change, but maybe your partner has never considered what it would be like to be with you when you're happy. Like they don't even know what deal could, could happen. Right. Like they don't even know how nice it might be if you were happy and then you had a side hustle and then that paid for, or even if you buddied up with a neighbor and traded off half day, like I, this even works if you have no money. Yes. But for me, being happy around my children is the best thing that I can do for my kids. And then I think every person has a magic number of the amount of hours they like to spend sleeping, exercising, playing with their children. Yes. And everybody is different. I don't, you know, I don't uh, prescribe mine to anybody else, but you got to tell the truth about it. Like I have about three hours a day that I can be present for my family and be at my best. And that's it. And then I make sure they're gainfully loved those other hours of the day by other people, by other people and activities, you know, and I, that works great for me, but I don't prescribe that. That's just my truth. I, I, See, what I was about to say is I love that honesty, which is hilarious, given that that's our entire conversation, right? Is But I, it's just so refreshing to hear you honor that. And by the way, that's on the weekends. During the week, it's like an hour and a half. Like it's maybe, like, maybe two. But that doesn't mean it's anyone else's ideal, right? You, you could have exactly. someone who's just yearning to have six or eight truly. waking hours with them and someone else who like one is a lot. It truly. Right. And when I had my first kid, I mean- I have three now, right? When yes. I had the first one in the, that first couple of years, I wanted to do, you know, four or five hours a day. Like I, I wanted to, I wanted to learn what that was. I wanted to get to know this human. I, I felt, you know, it was the first one. I was curious, <laughs> but then I learned. <laughs> so fascinating. It's so fascinating. Hey there, have you heard the news? I am going on tour in 2021, virtually, of course. I am so fired up to talk to a ton of you in 2021, and I would love to add your event to our tour schedule. The topic is something near and dear to my heart. It's work-life balance redefined. So if you're hosting an event, a meeting, a conference, a symposium where this topic would be a hit, let's talk. Dates are available on a first-come, first-served basis, and they are going fast. So head over to brilliant-balance.com forward slash tour and get the wheels in motion. I'll see you on the virtual road. So truth-telling, just like you're modeling, is it's a game changer, right? It's rare, like we've been talking about. And I'm hearing there are kind of a couple of pieces, as I've read your work, that are we can really do two big things in this arena. One is staying in integrity with ourselves. Like you were just saying, honoring your truth about how much time you want to spend with your family or work or do whatever. Bring that honesty into to our own life. Like be honest with ourselves and then be honest with others about that. 
And then also the second piece, which is like bringing our skeletons out of the closet. We haven't talked about that yet today, but you, you talk about this in your TED talk. And that one is a little more polarizing, I think, as you, as you internalize it, right? Because it sometimes feels like, what good is going to come of that? Right. Right. So can you share a little bit about if we have a lie, we have to bring into the light. Yes. How do you do that in a way that is not just a disaster? Okay. Great. I'm just taking notes because you're bringing up so many, so many good topics. And I just want to, I just have to circle back for one minute before I address this question and just say, I believe children need quality individual time with their parents. Just like, so I just, that's my second value, right? So I have regular quality one-on-one attention time where I'm not on my phone with my children right? and my husband and any important relationship, my, my mother, right? Like any important relationship. So I just want like, it sounds a little callous the way I was like, you know, yeah. I, you know, like, I don't like you people. I really, I like them and I love them and I want to give them my full attention and love in proportion to all my other dreams as well. Okay. Yes. Now bringing lies into the light. So the first thing about the secrets we're taking to the grave with us to just understand is that on some level, you don't think that's acceptable. Like you don't think it's okay. There's shame in this. There's shame in it, right? Mm -hmm. So so we say what you hide owns you, right? Like it's not part of your story. It you're part of its story, right? It owns you. It's the it's the boss of you, right? Because you have to pander to it. You're not allowed to be your whole self. You're not allowed to have made that bad choice. You're not allowed to have had that bad thing happen to you. Like as if we're not having spiritual lives, right? As if there's no rhyme or reason to all this, right? So I wish for people that they don't believe that. I wish for people that they believe that they're spiritual beings, that they believe that, that I actually believe that, and this, I didn't make this idea up, but I actually believe that there's a soul and the soul picks the issues of the parents at the time of conception. Like the soul actually is in for this goodie bag and let me just again say, there's not a million things that human beings are shameful about. There's like 30, right? It's not a million things. It's really not. Like if you put your list down and then you think, well, I wonder if my neighbor has any of these lists. Yeah, they do. I've okay. I've read I've read thousands of lists. I barely ever hear something new. That's oh, you, you hurt a pet when you were little? Oh, you got caught masturbating? Oh, you peed in your pants? Oh, you were really mean to your sibling? Oh, you, like there's no new ones. Like okay. try to give me one. <laughs> okay. Right. So, so we all, I'm not going to give you one. <laughs> we, all have, we all have this list. Or you have seen this list across the many, many people you've taken through this process. And the things that we think are so unforgivable, right. unimaginable, unlivable, right? Your experiences, they're not. Once they are shared right. with the people that we've been keeping them from. Right. Then you, your shame gets unlocked. Other people can unlock their shame. Other people can tell you how they relate. You can find out how that issue is in your lineage because most likely it is very unlikely that you came up with this thing, the issue yourself. Like it's very weird how it repeats. Which that goes back. That's your soul theory is that it's you're put into this family for a reason that there's that you're here to evolve about. that thing. Yeah, that that thing actually could be a gift for you, not a curse. Okay. Right. And 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 then for moms, you know, if moms are listening, I also think like I know my kids are going to repeat. I just know it cuz I see it everywhere I look and I know about epigenetics and I know about nature and nurture. If I don't want it to repeat, I better expose it, talk about it, teach about it, give love to that thing, whatever that addiction mm-hmm. or abuse or eating disorder, or what you know, whatever. Sexuality, gender, you know, it's again not a hundred things that's my only chance at kind of making sure my kid doesn't have to repeat the pain of whatever I went through. How do you share it with like, so we, I had asked some questions from our community and, and someone's quite, there's the, there's our own secret. There's also sometimes we're trusted with someone else's secret and we're being asked to take that to the grave. Right. (laughs) So, so let's take them separate. That's a very hard one. If the yeah. first one so, is so, it's our own, how do you decide who to share it with? With someone awesome that you love and trust with your heart, right? Because you're practicing. You're practicing being all of who you are with another human being, right? A lot of people, obviously, their coach is the first person they ever tell. Mm-hmm. Then maybe their partner or their best friend or their mother or maybe definitely not their mother, right? Like, <laughs> so it's, it's, there's a safe person, right? Because you're, but 
ideally, like I tell everyone, all of mine, right? I'm just like, who else will listen? <laughs> because the more piece of people listen, the more it's untabooed and the more yeah. freedom humans have. You know, what I keep and thinking I think we'll about is you're talking, I would, I keep, I think I misunderstood like who needed to be shared. Your idea is someone, pick someone safe, pick Start someone. with someone. Yeah. Start with someone. Just it's not like you need to go. To your phone. Yeah. And so what I was thinking about when you were saying that is, you know, in my faith tradition, um, in the Catholic tradition, we have a sacrament for this. Like there is a sacrament that we used to be called exactly. confession, we call it reconciliation. Exactly. It's the idea of being able to sit and clear this from your conscience, from your soul, so that you can move forward, right? And that that sacrament has a lot of baggage around, you know, why we're doing it and what. But I think the uh, the the best definitions that I've gotten are so that you can move forward, so that you can be back in Absolutely. a relationship where you feel clear, yeah. right? Like there's nothing blocking your relationship with God. So I think yeah. this is interesting because exactly. it's it's a way of getting there, right? It's a way of having that experience, at least with the first. And, and, and therapy doesn't cover it. Like often therapy doesn't cover it. Sometimes it does, but like it's not being done because it takes an incredible amount of courage to do it. So, pe- so there's no, there's not a lot of narrative about how awesome it is and how easy it is and how great it goes and how, because we're just very new yes. at even considering doing this, mm-hmm. right? So if you think about it, it's only like the fifties and sixties when people even started talking about their feelings at all, <laughs> like even start talking about like, you know what? I don't really like staying at home with the kids or, you know what? I would like to study physics or, you know, like that's like new from just 50 years ago, yes. even to, to, yes. to think we can now talk openly about sexuality and gender and religion and money and race and all these taboo topics is it's very Pretty new. Yes. Yeah. And yet we so need it. <laughs> just, we do. Well, right. and I think we see it generationally. A lot of us have talked about, you know, our parents and it just didn't have the opportunity to have some of these conversations. They kind of think we're a little crazy to be so open and sharing, right? So there's this evolution of it. But when you sit your parent down and you go, you know what I want? I Do you want to really know me? Would you like to really know who I am? Would you like to know what I've been up to the last 30, 40, 50 years? They go, yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. I'd like, I'd like to know, maybe I don't want to tell the neighbors, but you know, you could tell me. Yeah. <laughs> right? And then they I might start know. to tell you, you know, who they are, right. which is very intimate and wonderful. Tell me, we, I mentioned this before and we skipped over it. I want to come back that what if we're trusted with someone else's yeah. secret yeah. and, you know, we've been sworn to secrecy, but we can see the toxicity that it is yeah. creating. What, what's a pathway to encouraging someone to open up, not to sharing their secret. You know, you know how I say like uh, prevention versus treating the symptom, right? You know how doctors say that. So people don't give me their secrets because they know my policy, right? They know, I believe in truth telling. They know, that's my jam. So even someone will say, like, I want to share this thing with you. And I'm like, don't. Is it a secret? I'm not really interested. Like, I'm just not really interested. It's not the kind of friendships I want to have. I really want to have friendships where everyone's up to growth and truth and development. And on like, I this is such an important value to me. So I don't generally have people telling me secrets. Obviously, my clients, everything's confidential. That's totally easy for me to not talk about because that's the the structure of the, of the conversation, but people in my personal life, because I actually don't hold a secret. Well, like it doesn't feel good to me. It feels like someone's suffering and I can't help. Right. And I don't, I don't like that feeling. So I don't really want to hold that. I'm great. If you want me to help you figure out how to say that to someone, that's fabulous. I'm paid for that. And I'll do it for free for my family, but you know, so that's my setup. And I really recommend Everyone has that set up so they don't have the burden of holding people's lies. However, in an ideal world, you don't have to hold anyone's lies. And you really could be the kind of friend that's like, if you don't tell by the end of the year, I'm going to. Like, you you really could be the kind of friend that's like, I believe in your freedom and your happiness, and I'm not going to hold this anymore. You could be, like, so it just, it's it's your personal integrity. It's not for me to assign mm-hmm. morality to it. It's just, the world would be better if you if there were no secrets. Like, those secrets are not helping that person. If they're going to go to jail, right, or they're going to get physically hurt, again, like if you have a good reason, a good reason, but most people's reasons you think are good, they're not actually good. They're just, you're just protecting yourself from feelings. You're protecting yourself from a divorce. I think that's an important nuance, though, that there probably are 
some secrets, I could imagine, that would have pretty serious repercussions if they were not just feelings, right? But pretty serious repercussions. You name, like you named somebody who would go to jail, right? I think there, there seems like there is some nuance to encouraging them to share and knowing, like, again, it's certainly exactly. not ours to That's share. That's why I'm saying it's a very personal choice. It's not a moralistic proclamation that everyone, sh- I certainly don't think everyone should tell everything they think at all times. That's mostly garbage. It's the most important things with the most important people. And if you choose not to, like, I'll just give a very common example. If you're never going to tell your partner you cheated, mm-hmm. it's a very common example. Okay. I get it. You're not willing to risk the marriage, right? You want to keep, keep it going, but you're never going to get to an eight, nine or 10 on a scale of one to 10. That's what we like to do things on scales. Sure. You're never going to get to that high level of intimacy and connection because you're always hiding a part of who you are and you're always one-upping them in the power dynamic because you know something they don't know. Mm-hmm. P.S. If you're doing it, they're probably doing it too. So just be clear. You don't know what's going on in their life either. Because the whole relationship has been built on that separation. I think this is, I'm just sitting thinking through the lens of our listeners or trying to think through the lens of the people listening. And like, I'm so grateful that you're sharing some of the most common things you hear because that'll really help people listening think about, I really think I'm the only one. And as soon as you say, well, this is like the most common one, or this is one I hear all the time, it starts to unlock a little bit of <laughs> like we're even then, right? Because we can get yeah. so hung up on like, but this thing for me, this is different than, you know, whatever it is. I, I, I think the betrayal of someone's confidence is like a value, right? Like a lot of us, I feel like I hold this value. Like if you tell me something in confidence, it is my honor to say, I will hold that in confidence. So this flies a little bit in the face of that. And that's what you're watching me grapple with. Well, again, you're at a very advanced level right now. Like most people can spend their whole life just working on not lying in their own life. Just your own lies will keep you plenty busy before you worry about anybody else's truly. So you're at a very high level when you're talking about that. And again, it's not a moral question. It's more about what are your values in friendship? What what do you want for your friend? Maybe you can convince your friend to tell, right? That would be much better. Which would give them the freedom that they need. Yeah. So they not really demonstrate You demonstrate it, right? You role model it. it. it It's so sexy that they catch on. Or you go, listen, I can't talk anymore until you go to therapy, like whatever. Till yeah. you get a coach, till you go sort this out. So there's you have many gradations between I go blab someone's secret and I just have to live with people telling me secrets all the time. Right. And it's not telling their secrets to everyone else. Like there's this childhood sort of, you know, schoolyard oh, crap of, yes. you know, oh, well, she told you and then she ran and told 10 other people and now everyone knows. Like that is where the... I think the basis of not wanting to share comes from, because those are painful experiences that you share something in confidence and someone. But just imagine it was okay. Like imagine a world for our kids where if you peed on yourself, you weren't shamed and ostracized. If you messed up at the school play, if you, if you got sexually assaulted, if you like, imagine if you, if you didn't understand your gender, if you, whatever, like imagine if we were in a world where, Everyone knew they had a goodie bag. Like everyone knew they had a list of things they were embarrassed about, a list of things that happened they didn't like. And everybody was just like, ooh, do our goodie bags match? Like, do we, are we friends? Are we like, instead of everyone pretending they don't have one. So if we, so if we help our friends not hide, whatever it is from racism to abortions, to cheating, to an interest in something that's maybe not normal in your community, like whatever, then everyone gets permission to be more themselves. I'm just trying to get a world where everyone has permission to be themselves so we can stop hurting each other yeah, and killing, and killing each other and hating each other. It's going to be a hot topic, Lori. This is going to be a hot topic. Okay. So I have just a couple more questions. I really want to get to how do we stay in integrity with ourselves, right? Because a lot of the women listening have big things they want to do, mm-hmm. right? That they say like, I want to do this thing. I want to I want to be this person, this kind of person or I want to have this habit regularly in my life. But then we don't do it. Right. And then we're so good at rationalizing why yes. we don't do it. So, good summary. <laughs> your this process that you have for consequences is so interesting. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yes. Okay. So if you think about it, the handle method has really four steps. First you articulate the vision because if you don't articulate the vision and your why and get it locked into your heart, who cares? You're never going to keep a promise to begin with. 
right? So first you have to go, why do I care? Why do I care? Why? So like, you know, when I came to coaching, I wasn't having sex with my husband anymore, right? I was like, I had two little kids that, you know, and why do I, I don't care. <laughs> like, there, but there was no why I care. I had to go like, oh, well, maybe it would make me happier. Maybe it would be good for my sleep. Maybe it would get us connected. Maybe he would do more chores. Like, you know, I had to find the why yep. behind it first. Okay. So get your why. Then we work on your inner dialogue. Like, okay, what are your BS excuses? My excuses were the kids. I'm tired. Meanwhile, I was eating crap all day, every day. Once I stopped eating crap all day, I wasn't so tired. I slept better. I had a libido, right? Fascinating. Okay. So you, you listen to your inner dialogue and you start to learn what's useful, what's not useful, what's true, what's not true. What, what becomes true is that there's certain things you need to do and not do that make all the difference that you don't want to notice are the things. Like you don't really want to notice that if you didn't drink the two glasses of wine at night, you'd have finished written, writing your book. You don't want to notice that if you put a lock on your, your social media, you would have, you know, prepared your Christmas list or what, whatever mm-hmm. it is, right? We don't want to tell the truth about what the issue whatever is. Whatever it is. Whatever right? it is. Right? For <laughs> me, I'm eating sugar all day, of not listening to my husband, avoiding sex and, and not doing business development, right? I was like, I don't understand why my business isn't growing. It's, it must be the economy. It must be my staff. Right? Instead of like, oh no, I'm not talking to anyone about my business. Maybe. Yes. Okay. Yes. So like, yeah. So you tell the truth about what the issue is. Then you make the promise. The promise is a stretch, but doable. So like when I first came to coaching, I didn't stop eating. I just stopped eating sugar at every meal. <laughs> right? like I, I crazy, Magic. Right. And then I didn't just start like making my entire job business development. I started making two calls a day before noon. That's it. Okay. Or no TV at night, eat according to my food plan or no protein bar the next day, which was Mm -hmm. my treat, my sugar treat. Right. Interesting. So I put in the consequence, but again, the point is the promise has to be a stretch, but doable. I'm not going, I'm going to run a marathon next week. Right. Right. A stretch, but doable promise. And then it's an annoying little consequence. Like I'll give you another example. My current commitment is to have sex with my husband twice a week. That's my magic number, right? Like that's the number of times that makes me feel connected the whole week long. That doesn't interrupt my sleep. That doesn't, whatever. It's like our, our number, right? Okay. It used to be twice a year, <laughs> twice a week. All right. Someday it might be different, more or less. I don't know. Right. But that's what it is right now. If I do not follow through on that promise the following week, my consequences, I have to have sex outside of the bedroom. Outside the bed. <laughs> I like that. Everyone's breath just stopped. As, yeah. as playing family. I like that as much as like, like, why would I need to? I like to be under three blankets with the heat on, like with my socks on. Like the idea that I have to now go be creative and youthful. No, thank you. So that is an annoying enough consequence that I barely ever, like once a year, I break. My well, mouth. and it's also directly related to your commitment. So if somebody was saying, I am going to walk two miles a day, right? And then their consequence has to be something that's connected. It, does it or doesn't it? Not necessarily. It? Okay. But not necessarily. It has to be something that is annoying and not punitive. Because some of us are a little punitive. Mm. Right? Some of us are like, I have to skip my Pilates. Right. Like, right. No. Your body, <laughs> or, okay. or I'm like taking, you know, I'm gonna fast the next day. Like, no, it's like, it's annoying. Like, if I'm late to dinner with my family, I love family dinner. I believe in it. Yeah. If I'm even one minute late, my kids get twenty bucks. That is annoying. <laughs> <laughs> like, I do not want to pay them twenty. I can, I can live with it, but oh my gosh, it's annoying enough that I am never late. Yeah. Again, like once or twice a year, I mess up. I am truly sorry. I pay my consequence, and then I set seventeen more alarms. Yes. You know, because I'm never going to pass that up Oh again. my gosh. Uh, I, my, my head is reeling with consequences <laughs> for all the things I'm trying to make myself do. I, because we talk a lot about rewards. I think culturally we talk about rewards, right? And what are you earning and how do you treat yourself for doing it? And, and some of us candidly are just more motivated by a consequence. That's scientific. That's not weird. That right. is a scientific phenomena. Frankly, the reward the reward is a great sex life, a great career, a great body, a great healthy, you know, stats. Like, yes, we get the, the reward is the reward. The but reward is the reward. We're not motivated by rewards. We yes. are not. Because annoying we don't consequences. Think, that is, that is the thing. Annoying, the Im- immediate, like pretty immediate, annoying artificial consequences stick in our heads and motivate us to, because we like to avoid pain. We don't, we don't like pleasure that much. You know, like we don't really, if we did, we'd, do more good things for ourselves. Right. <laughs> well, I think you and I could do this 
all day, but I'm going to wrap us up with, I want to make sure people know where they can find you. Cause I think we've opened Pandora's box here and people are going to want to know how do I learn more yeah. about this? So where can our listeners find you online? The best place is Lori Gerber underscore coach, L-A-U-R-I-E-G-E-R-B-E-R underscore coach. It is Instagram on that Instagram page. We have the link in bio the bio link gives you everything. You can schedule a time to talk to me about private coaching. You can re- listen to the TEDx talk. You can look at our digital programs that are super inexpensive and on sale right now. You can, what else? You could take a free quiz. You can listen to old podcasts. You can come to free events. I do a, a call, you know, every morning at 9 a.m. You can you, you can also just watch videos. <laughs> There's everything. Tons of goodies. Everything Tons of goodies. Okay. So Lori Gerber underscore coach on Instagram is the best place to go. We'll link it up in the show notes so everybody Perfect. can find you. Yes. Um, I'm going to do a quick speed round with yes. you. Yes. Uh, there are just, I think, five questions. So first one, what makes you feel brilliant? When people listen to my coaching and make changes in their life. What's your favorite time-saving or productivity hack? A digital calendar. Like I know some people are still using paper. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry, but you can't have dreams in all areas of your life on paper. It needs to be digital. Is that too simple? Is no, it's perfect. Okay. Amen. What have you learned to say no to? Consuming the news through traditional media. What's one dream you're chasing these days? I have an autoimmune health condition and I am disappearing it. What's the song you turn on when you need to get in the zone? Okay, everybody will know exactly how old I am now. It is I Rise by Madonna. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Lori, I can't thank you enough. This has been a fantastic conversation. I'm really encouraged by you know, the freedom that people can experience when they live in integrity with themselves and with the people that they're in relationship with. So thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. It's been amazing. This is the podcastfactory.com.